years. Hey, I'm still Vince. <laughs> and I still have been uh, publishing the River West Currents for uh, over 20 years. We started actually as a, uh, as a newsletter of the YMCA. And then I got some funding to turn it into a tabloid from the Metropolitan Milwaukee Fair Housing Council. So on your screen, I'm going to just go into uh, the paper itself. I want to show you the first issue. I'm going to go through just a couple of issues uh, that kind of show what the paper is, if you're not familiar with it, and what our, our vision and, and mission was. Uh, basically, uh, we wanted to represent the neighborhood in a way that made people familiar with the things that were going on here and the opportunities and that this was a good place to live, work, and play and to record it, what had, has become is a history of the neighborhood uh, that's fairly extensive. This has been coming out every month and there's a lot of stuff that in here. The first issue is on, on the screen, if you can see it, it says reservoir no longer needed. And it's an aerial photo of the reservoir, reservoir park, which overlooks the river. And that was serviced to distribute water to the entire neighborhood. So when we started, uh, I was able to use some of the money that we got to start the paper to hire son, uh, young Knaus. She's now in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada with her husband, Dan Knaus, who uh, actually did the, and still helps me with the web presence for the paper. Uh, Sonia was educated as a journalist, so it was, it was really a, a, a great relationship to start with her. And the first paper was kind of slim. It was 12 pages, all black and white. But the cover story was, I think, fairly significant in that this reservoir and this issue played a role in the neighborhood and the adjacent neighborhoods for quite a few years. Uh, Donna Schleyman wrote about Kilbourne Reservoir Park in its history in this issue, Donna passed away, but she led uh, led the uh, the campaign to preserve reservoir and the park in its form to preserve the hill uh, because they de they didn't need this reservoir anymore because we had better pumps than they did in the in the early, actually the middle of the uh, 19th century. When, when we first started using this reservoir for water for, for drinking in the city. So it was, it was really a good choice of an issue. This is, this is a letter from the editor and you can see over on the, the right here, uh, some of the first people that helped Sonia, myself, Tess Reese was very instrumental in, when we started doing sales right away to help uh, support the paper. And almost all these people, Jan, Christensen, Kevin, Evan Gordon, Carl Hedman, Jay, Ken Leinbach, Eric Peterson, Jim Poliak, Peter Reese, and Tom Schneider, Tanya Cormarty Twaddle, and I don't really remember who Patrick Weishampel is. And Maureen Kane did the original layout, and Dan is now up in Canada. We published 5,000 papers. We had a, a just a newsletter before that. Uh, let me get this back up. Nope, it's not the one, sorry. We had just a newsletter before that in the letter to the editor here, from the editor that is, uh, she talks about how the paper had started uh, three years earlier with Jean Gerasi and myself out of the YMCA. I proceeded to kind of move the paper away from uh, the Y uh, because uh, it was becoming clear to me that I wanted this to be not so much associated with a nonprofit, but be to be an independent source of news and information for River West and the adjacent area. Uh, you'll see a couple other stories here. The River West Co-op just opened a few months before uh, the paper started to publish and they're still in existence. They just celebrated their 20th anniversary as well. Um, There's a story about Center Street bid and if maybe some of you know Carl Hedman, he's a philo retired philosophy professor, but he was also very active in co-ops. Uh, Outpost was in River West and in a smaller form in, in a couple different locations. Carl 
uh, also was active in the Gordon Park Co-op, which was on Locust Street, which is now a garden park, a green space that we have. And if you know Carl, you, you maybe you would appreciate uh, what he's trying to say here. There's a quote from Carl, until recently it had come to believe that the first decade of the 21st century would be a period where good people continued to retreat into their private lives, licking their wounds. So Carl was very happy that the things that were going on in River West and particularly the, the co-op formation. In the lower corner, we had a Valentine's stance. Um, it was at the Gordon Park Pavilion to raise money uh, for the co-op. Uh, notice in the lower left-hand corner of this page the Gordon Park Pavilion just opened up. And there's a story about a woman and her, uh, her, her, her business. And then there's a, a, a figure called Eudemon. Now Eudemon is a mythical character. It's actually an alter ego of mine. <laughs> I started to write this and I pretended like I'd walk around the neighborhood and uh, write my experiences in a third person. I really enjoyed doing that. The, it's based on a character from Moravia called Radagast, uh, which is where my uh, uh, maternal ancestors came from. And it was this strange kind of woodland creature. And I told T. Krulos to do a drawing after describing it. And this is what he came up with. Uh, looks like a hillbilly with an ax and a bird on his shoulder <laughs> drinking a beer. <laughs> One of the features that uh, we started relatively soon, this is from the 2004 issue, uh, is the neighbor spotlight. This particular, so there's been one of these just about every month. So that means there's over 200 neighbor spotlights. It's been a very popular feature. And my vision right now at this time is to publish all of these together in a book. Uh, the photos uh, at, at this time were taken uh, by a professional phot photographer uh, whose name escapes me for a second. And, but we also received some of the money that we received meant we should uh, translate uh, some of the stories into Spanish. And you can see in the lower corner that this was Spanish. So this gives you an idea of of the, the, the range. There's only 11 here uh, in February. Peaches and Coco wouldn't let us take their picture. <laughs> I think that's the only time that, that happened. Uh, but you can see January, March, April, May, June, July, uh, August, September, October, November, and December. And this, these bring back strong memories for me. The April uh, picture right here is, uh, maybe you can see my little hand go on there, is John Lindquist. Uh, he was uh, an activist and a Vietnam vet against the war. Uh, he was married, he got divorced, he married somebody from England. I just saw him this summer down the block at uh, Black Husky Brewery. He's recovering from cancer from Agent Orange. But he looked really happy. It's great to see John Lindquist around. You can see the variety of people that we sponsored. The hands up here are Dr. Dave, he's now in, um, uh, in Colorado, I think, still uh, chopping up vegetables and a very uh, healthy oriented guy. And over here we got uh, with the dog we have, that's Mike Froming, and I still see him walking dogs down, down the, uh, the paths along the river and the beer line trail. And Andy and Shelly, they were, Shelly was the first uh, uh, employee of the co-op and Andy, did a whole lot of work with a lot of people to, to make that particular thing go. Okay, so here we have, this is the, we're up to two. So we started in 2002 as a tabloid and by 2004, uh, you can see we have a lot of color, we have more pages and a lot of activity. This is one year celebrating in January, all the things that happened in 2003. Uh, there's a little um, text at the bottom. Um, 
Richard Penny was playing at the Center Street Festival. Uh, there was Rocker Box, which was put on by uh, Fuel Cafe, which just kind <laughs> of closed recently. The Milwaukee River is one of the reasons why I'm here and uh, where I've worked. I worked for 15 years doing restoration activities along the Milwaukee River. Uh, number four is uh, Marina Lee, who's down in the lower part here. She had these piece sculpt, uh, sculptures that she did. And Nancy Sents uh, was Lady Liberty and pr promoting shopping at the co-op at the 4th of July. Uh, the, and over here, uh, uh, the Bishop is dedicating St. Casimir as Our Lady of Divine Providence uh, when they re rearrange the Catholic parishes. And I think this is a Milwaukee Public Theater doing stuff at uh, uh, the Locust Street Festival uh, with the drummers. And the River West Accordion Club is in the middle with Sarah Kozar, who has passed away, uh, unfortunately. But there's all these memories of the, all these great times that we had over the years. Uh, Tom Schwark and uh, Texas Dave are playing at Garden Market, which has moved to Pierce Street now, but that's still going on. The belly dancers were part of the uh, Center Street uh, art cart race. They were on a cart and then they started the belly dance and the guys in the X cart just got transformed by, <laughs> by that. Um, the Summer of Peace celebration in Gordon Park, the celebration of the, of the uh, uh, Milwaukee Rowing Club opening up their uh, launch and deck in their new facility on the river. Again, over here, the uh, art cart race and this is Ruth Weil I think and she's doing a, a, a diversity thing in Gordon Park. Uh, this is called the Bagpack Pipers of Porker Fest. I'm not sure what that one, but maybe some of you uh, recognize Frank Seiler, the former mayor and um, the author of the, uh, the River West history, Tom Tolan. Uh, celebrating and what I think at that time was an OPA, and then Marina Lee and war, a war protest. So, so that's this kind of this to me shows the whole year uh, on a spread in the paper. Politically, there's a couple things that the paper was able to do. Again, you see the neighbor spotlight, a story about absentee landlords, vacant commercial space, and art bar was art bar was just opening. I was just over there the other night. He's got his mini art show going, and uh, actually, Tom Tolan told me he thought our coverage of the, the mayoral race in, in 2004 was better than some of the stuff uh, that the journal was doing. Um, Again, we have T. Krulos doing an a illustration. I worked with, tried to work with illustrators right from the get-go. And he's, look, do we vote, vote for the white guy or we vote for the black guy? And we have two stories uh, and differing opinions on who, who should be the next mayor. Well, we all know that's Tom Barrett, who is now moving on to be ambassador. To, uh, uh, um, where is he going to be ambassador? But in, in any ways, um, once we get these politicians in, so it's kind of good to have a, a strong dialogue about about uh, where or who and how we have our elections. I got that one already. Now moving on to uh, the 2008 issue, kind of hopping around. Uh, so when we started, we have 12 pages of black and white. And uh, so this is kind of like the heyday uh, in the middle of this 20 years uh, before uh, Facebook and all the other social media stuff uh, put a lot of pressure on small papers. I'm still proud that we're still publishing this. It gives us an opportunity to present uh, issues on a neighborhood level or village level, as some people would call call it. 
uh, that you wouldn't have that's not going to be covered anywhere else. Uh, local elections are real important. Uh, we had an aldermanic election, and when you have those, when uh, Mike D'Amato retired, uh, there's all these candidates. I think there are seven or eight candidates that came out uh, for this election. And in, in the middle of this, you can see this little star. Uh, the question that they were asked to answer is what kind of development and how would they perceive on the uh, corner of North Avenue right. and the river on the east side. Uh, that is now um, uh, the, uh, a dorm. Uh, but all these candidates answered that question. In the primary, all these people ran, and Nick Kovac and Patrick Flaherty came out of the primary. And Nick Kovac is our present alderman. And that just goes to show you, so that's 2008 to 2021. He's been elected. Once you get in there, it's kind of hard to get out. I'm not saying anything negative about Nick. It's just. Uh, it's important to take these uh, elections seriously when they come up, in my mind anyway. Sarah was, uh, Sarah Farage, a lot of people know her, and she was working hard, but she didn't make it through the primary. I wrote an editorial about democracy with a little d, again, emphasizing how we should participate it. Uh, now you can see I'm listed as a publisher and I have a new editor, Jan Christensen. Nick Kovac was actually working for me, but I think we maintained pretty much uh, arm's length as far as I didn't support anybody for the actual election. Uh, further downstream was a very popular series where we just little things that were going on. Um, the uh, Lots of these are available online, but it does give you a history. So from a historical perspective, these are very interesting to see what was going on, what happened, what still exists. Uh, Urban Ecology Center was a participant as far as giving uh, information and stories. And Bill Bergner had a column called Ask the Ecologist and Sarah Moore, Green Folks Garden. So we had a lot of uh, separate columns. Again, uh, the neighbor spotlight was always a popular and still is a popular feature. Occasionally we do some, uh, some um, obituary type uh, stories and we lost Calvin Greer, uh, it's just to the west of River West and, uh, but he was, a much loved personality in the neighborhood. More uh, campaign stuff. The Follies, I've been doing the Follies. Uh, this year, uh, I started up again after missing it. I'm going to do it on, at Lindemans on November 20th. Uh, but this <laughs> there was an escape artist on uh, previous year. Uh, but this was the November 8th issue of the Follies, which is a, a hodgepodge of entertainment, music, dancing, singing. Uh, and this year, even a little play. The River West Follies is one of the things that I really did and do enjoy doing as part of uh, the work here with the currents. We had a lot of advertising from schools. Altera Coffee was relatively new on the, in their location. And what is, what is now the, um, uh, the, the the brewery on center was Stonefly Brewing Company for, for a little while, and before that, it was Anopa. Uh, still old and dusty, uh, Blifford Lumber hadn't built their new building. Uh, Blifford Lumber, if you're familiar with it or not familiar with it, it's sort of like a meeting place. It's kind of unusual to, uh, <laughs> maybe not unusual, but it's sort of like the old, old, old corner store thing where people would come. And I, I, I meet people all, all the time when I go there. And I'm usually there several times a, a week getting something I need. Um, another issue that was in the news before uh, 2004 was the dorm, which is on the uh, west side of the river called Riverview. A lot of uh, debate and, and within the community about, about that dorm and what it could be. And I was uh, very much a part of that and that I was interested in getting the trail preserved uh, that was of the former Beer Line Railroad Corridor, which we successfully do. And now we're celebrating this year um, 
15 years of the, the Milwaukee River Greenway that extends from basically Humboldt Boulevard all the way up to the county line. Uh, one of our one of my favorite writers and uh, person was Jackie Reed Detloff. Uh, she did a column called the Garden of the Month. Jackie's still with us, but she's uh, kind of like a, having a little bit of a problem with some from some issues, memory issues. So uh, we all I do wish Jackie well. Uh, we had a lot of school advertising. You'll notice when we get into the present issue, a lot of these advertisers have been lost, partly hurt by the COVID epidemic. Uh, but also partly because of changes in how we receive and share media. Maybe not for the better, at least not from my perspective. perspective. Gensland had a cooking club that they were advertising. Sometimes it's interesting to see who's advertising to understand how, uh, what is in it. Uh, Mark Winger, another sad story about a person who had some- uh, Yes some issues and, and is no longer with us, but- she Yes, and I'm experiencing the same thing. Okay, somebody else is talking. <laughs> um, Kathy Brooka, there's some River Westers that own, own that. It's now a different, different uh, location. Lakefront is still with us. Fourth Street Forum was a popular uh, way of communicating uh, about issues that uh, I attended a number of times. Uh, we, the calendar was always a popular feature for the paper, and we we're starting to get that again. More things are happening again in person, not just, not just Zoom. Um, this, this I thought was kind of an interesting picture. Uh, I'm on the board of, excuse me, Woodland Pattern, and this was some kind of performance they had. I wish I would have seen it. It looks interesting. Uh, Woodland Pattern is just up on, and G. Willikers is still there, still running, but uh, the owner has passed away. Nick Kovic won the election uh, that was covered in this one. The spaghetti benefit dinner for the, for the co-op has been going on for years, and hopefully we have another one this January, and Outpost has been a strong uh, advertiser ever since we started. So I'm zoomed through this, <laughs> uh, but I, I wanted to uh, just show you some of the some of the copies of the paper, and and to do this um, in person I would actually just have the paper, but on Zoom I, I just use some PDFs that I have. I have almost all the issues uh, in in a nice record, and so does the Milwaukee Public Library have copies. I've been sending them there and the library in Madison. So this is a pretty extensive ish, ish, uh, record for the past uh, 20 years of this neighborhood. We're doing the Follies again. This is the 15th annual at, at uh, Linneman's on the 20th. And the crazy guy up in the corner is, uh, is the leader of Bristlehead. Uh, and we're gonna have Barbara Lee do uh, her her play, Confusadora. <laughs> ah, there she is, I can see you, Barbara. Wave again <laughs> uh, on the 20th. She's gonna be early on the schedule, so if you're interested in seeing her perform, um, consider coming. 104.1, uh, really one of the few places that have, have a radio station, usually they have a little story I'll be on there going over the Follies on, on next, uh, next Friday, because the Follies is on Saturday. Tree Moore uh, has been writing this kind of friendly column about life and love. Uh, she lives out in the country now, uh, but I kind of like her, what she writes, and I think a lot of other people do. Another uh, Rose Mayer, how many of you may know her? She's been around for a long time. She's the neighbor spotlight for the, the 2021 issue that just came out in November. Uh, I attended this peach tree, peace tree and mural in Pulaski Playfield, which is done by Native Americans. And the, the uh, 
the MPS uh, rec, rec division. Uh, a lot of a lot of partners went there. This it's a nice nice little park, and they planted a white pine tree. You can see that in the picture. Plus this this beautiful mural that was down down there. This park has been Pulaski Playground. Is uh, if you know where it is, it's on Pulaski Street, uh, and it's a small park with a baseball diamond. It's had a couple of renovations. Uh, it's one of these these MPS play fields that actually can play a a, a very vital role and, and this park is used a lot by local school kids. Uh, it's it's a kind of a nice place. Uh, Carrie Chair Carl, Carlson has been doing restaurant reviews for me and with me and a little little hike reviews recently. She'll start doing restaurant reviews again. This is Esterbrook Park, uh, which is a great place. I, I love Esterbrook. Uh, it's, it's not as close as, as Gordon Park is, and, and Riverside Park as far as my hikes and being out, out in the wild. Um, but it's good for a beer and it's uh, great to watch the fish and I canoed up and down there. Nice little park, nice little story too. Okay, we turn the page here. Let's see, let's go. Okay, we got Owl, Older Wise Local uh, and the schedule of events there. Uh, I was there, there was a good crowd there. Um, that must have been Thursday, um, and doing doing making these little cards, um, which I enjoyed a lot with Darlene Hagopian. Uh, Ruth Weil, if you don't know her, she's she's been a very strong activist, and she works with RiverWorks, which is this organization that focuses somewhat more on the the north end and to the west. Of River West, uh, but uh, Ruth also handles the market, which has now been on Pier Street. Uh, a friend of mine, Tim Ladwig, has got his paintings up at the um, art bar right now, and these are larger paintings. And then there's this whole gallery; it's worth it to go see. And you can pick up a, a little piece of art from from anywhere from twenty five to to seventy five dollars or more. Uh, these are more are larger, so they're more expensive. And maybe many of you know Harvey Taylor, and this is his poem, "Has Happy As Can Be. And he sent me this and a couple of pictures, and I'm glad to report that Har Susie and Harvey are going to be at the Follies doing their fun little gig on the 20th. Uh, this is Bristlehead uh, practicing and a couple <laughs> turkey comics. Uh, the calendar again. And uh, the elders have been so helpful in just sharing with me uh, some of this, a little, a little column. And I think Eileen and Lorraine came up with this idea of doing haikus. Uh, and they sent them in and I found some photos that kind of went along with some of them and along with Susan's um, painting at the top. S Susan wrote, tree colors change now, winds sweep leaves drifting to earth, beautiful painting. And then she just wrote a little note that I turned <laughs> into a haiku. <laughs> Perhaps I can make the beautiful trees stay while I capture the light. see here. Salas, am I saying your name right? N nod your head if I am. <laughs> uh, a fond farewell. This month's moon grows full, bathing leaves with silvery light, bidding them goodbye. Janine, uh, who's on a poetry writing uh, Wednesday group that I um, attend at Woodland Pattern, Come meet me at the intersection of summer, warmth, warmth and autumn light. And Juliana, last one. Oh, how the crow flies with myriads of snowflakes. We walk step by step. Uh, I'm very much interested in, I didn't really think of myself as a writer. My major in 
in the university was uh, environmental science, 30 credits of botany. And I ended up publishing a paper. And now I'm ending up writing a lot of poetry and I'm on the board of Woodland Pattern. So excuse me if I read you poems. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, one of the last pages here is uh, kind of like my sad story of how I got to, to be in River West. Um, and then I'm going to try to write a continually uh, chapters uh, about the last 20 years, uh, sort of like in a serial book form. This is sort of the introduction. It's not so much about River West, but how I got here. And it's a nice picture. Uh, one over the pedestrian bridge, uh, one of my favorite places to go hike and take a peek at the river and in any season. It's always the same and always changing. This is facing towards uh, North Avenue. We've had comics since the beginning. Uh, so it's been a nice relationship uh, with them. The Art Bar has been a long-term uh, advertiser. Sunrise Foods has uh, been pretty good recently too. Manual Motors is uh, where I get my car fixed. It used to be down the block in, um, in the, the brewery, <laughs> uh, which was really handy because my car's right out front because I just live half a block away. But Manual has done a good job for me. Outpost again has been a, a strong supporter as has a, the uh, Lakefront Brewery. Fishburgers Variety, I mean, it's really a nice little store and it's very popular. At, I'm sure I'm going to stop in there and just buy some stuff just to support uh, their effort there. And the poetry marathon and benefit is coming up uh, from Woodland Pattern, uh, which is a really great thing to watch too. It's, it's going to be done on Zoom like this is uh, this year because of still concerns about COVID. And I think, how are we doing on time? Let's see. Uh, I'm going to stop the share. I went through that pretty quickly, but uh, we had a little bit of a problem in the beginning, but I think <laughs> I think it went okay. Um, I guess I could be open for questions. What's that? Can you see the chat? Uh, I'll hit the button. Down at the bottom, chat. Okay, so Bruce asked me, can, can Bruce Wiggins, can you say what the impact of the paper has been to the neighborhood? Maybe by, by what other neighborhoods are without a paper or by what River West would have been without it? That, I, mean, I mean, it's something I started. It was, it's, and I keep on doing it. It doesn't make any money. Uh, and if I, if I can break even, I, I really am happy. Um, but I, I have put a, a a considerable amount of money into it to keep it going. Uh, people did donate this this year because of the COVID epidemic. We put on a request, and I also got a small um, uh, state grant, uh, which helped us get through through this year. So we're at just to give you an idea of how the paper started. It started out as this little black and white thing, and then went into a color. We got up to like about thirty two pages. One of the issues I showed you. Now we're at 16. I, I, I don't like it to get any less than 16. I think 20 would be optimal. I, I think the River West Currents played a role in identifying the neighborhood as a neighborhood. There's a lot of neighborhoods that are designated by the city, but most of them don't have such a strong identity. And I think we were helpful in creating that by being out there every month. Uh, and there's a lot of online stuff right now, uh, but without any moderation, it, it, it doesn't tend to bring out the best of us. It, it seems to me anyway, that in my little opinion, is that uh, um, some of the social media tends to bring out the worst of us and not focus on larger issues. So I'm going to continue to do it. And I think it has changed the neighborhood. Uh, other neighborhoods maybe don't have as strong as uh, an identity. There's only, there's a, there are a few other papers. There were a lot of papers being published at one time in Milwaukee. Uh, so that, that that 20 years has been a huge change in how we get information, as you all know. There certainly wasn't any Zoom back then. Uh, 
I, I think it's been positive. I think other people think so too. So that's why I keep on doing it. Uh, <laughs> Somebody says there's haikus there, yeah. It was it was a great pleasure to publish the haikus. Why do you think uh, River West is one of the few, the only neighborhood in that that supports a local food co-op? It's it, twenty years ago that that would be the same kind of difference between uh, what I said about public information as you have. What the heck? I touched the screen and made something going. Okay, um, small food co-op. Uh, I think that the key word is that um, the supports of food co-op. It's a small co-op. It's it's more like a corner store. And I've been I was on the board there. I'm not on the board there anymore. And Paula, just in in, in complete dis. Closure, Paula and I, my partner Paula, bought the building in order to facilitate the creation of the co-op uh, in about 20 years ago because they're they're 20 years old as well. So the 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 co-op has this warm feeling, and at the time it opened, it was a place you could get healthier food. Now you can get healthy food at any grocery store right now, and that makes it harder for us to keep it on a smaller scale. We did open up the restaurant. People love the food uh, and they have a new board and they're struggling with how to keep it going. Uh, they do need our support and I'm glad it's still there and I'm gonna <laughs> try to keep it going. Uh, why are we one of the few? Uh, because it's, it's, it's not easy to do and cooperatives in themselves are not easy to do. Making decisions in a group uh, believe me, <laughs> maybe that huff was as, by, as, as strong as I could be. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I'm going to take the spotlight off now of you. Okay. Um, I do have a question. Uh, can you tell us anything about what's happening with the uh, Falcon Bowl, bowling alley and hall? Well, the building was put on the market. I, I did make a little note in, in the previous issue of the Currents about, hey, it's kind of a shame that uh, the neighborhood doesn't have any say about this. It's all like, okay, who's got the money to buy it? Uh, it would be, if I just lay out what the Falcon Bowl is, the Falcon Bowl was, is owned by the Fraternal Order of Falcons, uh, which still exist in different cities and including in Chicago. And they opened this, this building and they owned this this building many many years ago and there's sort of like an investment where you could put your money uh and you'd get uh you know you get your return on your investment if you were a part of the falcons now it was it was polish falcon so it was dedicated toward the the group of people that lived around there then it's the largest hall in the river west area uh, normally i would be having the uh, uh, Follies at the Falcon Bowl. I've had it there for the la many previous years uh, because it's a nice big hall and it, it has that warm feeling. Uh, Lynn Okopinski is the owner of the bar and bowling alley, but she doesn't own the building. So the building was put up for sale and they had an accepted offer, but that seems to have kind of fallen through, partly because I don't think the parties that were trying to do this deal didn't really quite understand that the bowling alley is not owned by the building. So what, what do you, I mean, how do you, uh, uh, and that didn't maybe figure into the calculations or some kind of misunder, misunderstanding went on. So I've been told that the building is up again and it might be the same offer, uh, but people that are making these deals don't want to talk about it. So it's, I can't give you a definitive answer because there is no definitive answer and the parties that be that are in discussion aren't aren't sharing that. I, know, I think Lynn, if you know her, I, I know her quite well because she's been a, a great neighbor to have across the street from the co-op. Uh, I, I think Lynn would like to stay there, but I, I don't know if exactly. 
for a while she was talking about retiring and going living with her son, but her whole life revolves around the goings on uh, in the bar and the bowling alley. And it's just, it would be a shame to lose it. I wish I had a, uh, Mark, I wish I had a stronger answer, but we still have to watch and see what happens. At, um, the worst, the worst case for me would be to, for the thing to be sold and be torn down, and you know something else built there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So this is Bruce. Uh, um, there's one more question in the chat uh, that got sent to me directly, so I'll just ask it. Are there any other neighborhood newspapers in Milwaukee? And specifically, what about uh, waterfront uh, coverage? Water, what do you mean by waterfront? I'm not sure. Uh, Barbara was asking that question. So um, maybe she can unmute if she has some specific. Barbara Lee? Yeah. yeah. No, what I was asking is um, <coughs> there's the neighborhood news. <coughs> and neighborhood news seems to cover a lot of different neighborhoods in the city. And I asked if they were covering the waterfront, as in waterfront the whole city <laughs> not the specific waterfront it was a metaphor <laughs> uh, uh, neighborhood news is the online version and it's a uh, sponsored by marquette they they do a they do a pretty good job uh but that's not that's, that's not really they focus on neighborhoods but it isn't the neighborhood based uh um uh venue uh, I I started the Bayview Compass with Catherine Keller a number of years ago, and I believe she's still publishing it in, in Bayview. So that's another neighborhood that has um, a vestige of a newspaper going on, just like the, the occurrences is, is, is maybe not quite what it used to be, uh, but we're maybe getting a little bit better as we come out of COVID. Um, I, there are some there were just so many little papers uh, that were, some of them were downtown oriented, uh, but they're all gone. I, I don't know if some of you know of other papers that are still being, being published. We try to cover stuff in Harambe, but it's kind of hard when you, you know, there's only a few people doing all the work. Um, but uh, actually uh, Ruth Wild does help uh, bring us information uh, from our neighbors. I remember many years ago as, as, a, as a statement, uh, a 10 year old uh, child, a 10 year old boy wrote into the currents and said, uh, this, this person lived uh, on or, or near Holton Street. And from the mouths of the child, he said, when are the adults gonna fix Holton Street? <laughs> I mean, it's just really a dynamic thing. I mean, it's like, it's it's sort of this this border um, that uh, maybe is being being uh, um, nullified a little bit by some development that's coming up from downtown. The factors that change neighborhoods. I remember talking with uh, Frank Zeidler or or listening to Frank Zeidler, and he said. I think this was a very important lesson for me that neighborhoods are always changing. And if, and if you ask people, which I have done, because I did strategic planning for River West and the Lower East Side before I started publishing the paper, is people will say, oh, I like it just the way, like I like the River Valley. I like it just the way it is. Don't do anything. <laughs> well, if you took a picture of the River Valley every day for a hundred and some 20 years, you would be the most changed that you could possibly think of. It constantly changes, and even in a natural way, but also the dams went in, the dams went out, uh, the businesses were there, the businesses went out, we were swimming in the river, we couldn't swim in the river anymore because we weren't taking the sewage. Uh, I mean, it's just always, there's constant change. And Seidler, and that, that really stuck with me. <clears throat> Everything will change and you just do the best you can. And there's forces that are beyond your control. Like when they built the, the, the basketball stadium downtown, which 
we had a perfectly good basketball stadium. They had to tear it down and put up this big fancy one. But it pushed all kinds of development uh, up to the north, and that <clears throat> that will have some change, and maybe it'll change how Holton Street is per perceived and Martin Luther King, King Drive is perceived. We still have a ton of work to do uh, as far as bringing people together in our community. And hopefully I, hopefully publishing the currents helps a little bit, at least make people feel like that, that this is a, a real place. I mean, and I could talk, <clears throat> I mean, there's just, when I started doing a little research to do this today, <clears throat> I just, excuse me. I saw all the, all these things, people that have died, people that had made a difference, organizations that were here that have come and gone. Um, it just was very impactful onto my mood and onto like, wow, this is a lot of stuff. And I went over maybe three issues out of, uh, <laughs> What's 20 times 12, 240 <laughs> issues. Uh, and all those people that were neighbors, neighbor spotlights. I, 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 a lot of this stuff is online. Uh, you can look up uh, the whole paper or I'm, I eventually promise myself and everyone else that I'm, I will put all these neighbor spotlights in a separate folder online. And I want to publish that. And I'll write a little history. A long time ago, somebody said, why don't you write a little history? So <clears throat> I think I'll try to write, a, I will write a, a little serial history of, of this neighborhood and ask people, other people to contribute as well. Okay, are there any other questions? Um... <laughs> I have one last one. Um, for several years, we've attended the uh, Casimir um, uh, Festival in the spring. It used to be at the Falcon Bowl. Do you know if uh, St. Casimir is going to be doing a spring festival? I think, well, my guess is not because of, um, because of COVID. Uh, and hopefully, they do start that up again. It's always a lot of fun. Um, I live three blocks from the church. I still enjoy listening to the bells. The question becomes, what is going to come out of our, our culture and our society and our neighborhoods after we're, we finally have start to move out of um, this straight jacket that was COVID. Um, it, it's been quite an experience. Uh, I'm 73 years old and, you know, I just didn't think I would want to be living. I don't want to be, I'm a social person. I want to go and see people. Um, one of the, the, the uh, opinion writers in actually conservative in the New York Times said, I want to go into the bar and hear the laughter and talk <laughs> of people in a bar. And that's, you know, that's Milwaukee as well as <laughs> more than New York. <laughs> uh, I can't answer that question for sure about the Falcon and, and the party. And the, the, the reason I'm not having the uh, follies at the Falcon is because I don't know what the status is. And when I, I usually start several months in advance and I didn't know what was gonna be happening in November. And Linneman's has been very helpful uh, and he's got a great stage and a great sound system. It just makes it a little bit easier for me. And we have a nice lineup, including Barbara Lee. 